Hi guys, welcome back. It's the MLS update with me, Mike Rice, and today I'm delighted to say I'm joined here by Jeffrey. Jeffrey, how are we doing? I'm great. I'm great. It looks a lot nicer in Peru than it does in than it feels in Toronto, Canada, right now. Yeah. I gotta tell you, it's uh, <laughs> freezing, freezing cold. But yeah, uh, you know, after from a TFC perspective, after set, it feels like an eternity of of no moves whatsoever. We're finally seeing some incoming players uh, as opposed to confusing outgoing moves. So you know, on the yeah. on the day that that Apple TV launches its its MLS subscription package. It, it it feels apt to discuss uh, where TFC is coming into this uh, 2023 Frankenstein camp campaign. Uh, yeah, yeah, like you say, yeah, we're full focus on uh, Toronto in uh, in this episode. Um, can you let people know a little bit about yourself and uh, your experience following the team? Sure, sure. I started working at the SB Nation blog, uh, Waking the Red, uh, in 2018, which was the season following our MLS Cup uh, domestic treble. Um, obviously, a terrible season to start because we got the championship hangover in a big, big, big way. Uh, you know, obviously, uh, SB Nation has gone through a little bit of a rough patch in the last couple of days. Yeah. So the future of uh, Waking the Red is not really in doubt. It will continue in, in some capacity. Everybody that works there is far too passionate to let it just fall by the wayside. But in terms of where and how that happens, uh, nothing much to report then. Certainly keep your eyes open uh, with respect to Waking the Red and most other SB Nation sites. So, several have already gone on to you know come out of the cocoon to be whatever they're going to be, be that mm -hmm. a Substack paid site, uh, Patreon-based, or something a little bit different. In addition, you know, I I do a podcast myself, a, a live video cast with uh, with my two co-hosts, Michael Singh and Mike Newell. It's called Toronto Till I Die, and uh, we are on ostensibly every Monday uh, leading into the season and throughout the season. So come check us out there for a real deep dive into into <laughs> TFC. We we promise not to be too hipster for the newbies and and, and you know bring up. <laughs> bring up players that suited up for TFC for like five games in 2013, just, just to be <laughs> hipster, but so, sometimes it happens. And uh, yeah, that, that's sort of, that's sort of that for, for the, for the football aspect and, and, and my TFC kind of stuff, but you'll always find me on the interwebs, you know, uh, slinging out hot takes, guesting on podcasts and stuff like that. I, I love doing this. I love talking about the team and I love meeting people in the, in the sphere of, uh, of football coverage. I think it's important yeah. uh to have the fan perspective, especially when, you know, cl the, the, the trend is to, is for clubs to more and more control their own narrative in house, which I think is, is, I mean, it's a Faustian pack. If you're, if you're a public facing organization, you sort of leave that at the door. So this, this, mm -hmm. this idea that football clubs or any public facing uh, organization can control their own narrative is so patently false, but yeah, that <laughs> seems to be, that seems to be where, where, where things are going. And, uh, it makes it doubly important to to see the passion from, you know, right for lack of a better word, regular people talking about, uh, you know, MLS and and global mm -hmm. football and that sort of thing. So always a pleasure. Yeah, excellent. We'll definitely uh, get your um your links put in when we uh, get this tweeted out so people <laughs> can follow along and get get a good, fantastic uh, uh good understanding throughout the year on what's going on with mm. so like you say, there's so going to be so many different uh ways of the information coming out this year that yeah. uh, it's going to be yeah. a whole new thing for uh for everyone whole new who's thing. interested in soccer and football. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, uh so. Well, I was just going to say this. Have a little before we get uh, before we kick into what all the big arrivals and uh, the the big off season excitement. Um, so, a quick look back at last year, and mm. it wasn't exactly uh, how you guys probably would have hoped the season would have gone. There was a lot of waiting yeah. as well. <laughs> I mean, hopes are really powerful drug, and and you know yeah. we we at the outset of last season we were so careful in in terms of the fan base to try and insulate ourselves from what we knew was going to be essentially playing with house money um you know the when obviously when your club signs lorenzo insigne and and pays him that kind of a transfer fee that kind of throws everything yeah. in, in a bit of in a bit of uh chaos and certainly you know there were mixed messages coming from the club absolutely i mean you were we were watching a, a tfc squad that was almost entirely academy kids get mm. absolutely railroaded for the first half of the season whilst every banner on every street corner in toronto was lorenzo insigne's <laughs> exactly. face and, and 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 the so so it was a bit of a disconnect um 
But, you know, looking back with the benefit of hindsight, and certainly last season was incredibly frustrating for mm-hmm. TFC fans. And that and that has a lot to do, one, with just the way that the club works in Toronto, the expectation for success in Toronto. Yeah. The expectation for success with TFC is now almost tripled because we've been to the mountaintop. And, and yeah. you know, you, nobody wants to, 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 to hit the summit and then, you know, somersault back down the mountain. And it kind yeah. of felt in a way that we were doing that, you know, COVID hit the Canadian MLS clubs a lot harder than the American yeah. clubs. There was a season that we were basically a nomad club playing out of Hartford, Connecticut, that sort of thing with the coach, the coach changeovers. We knew upon signing Bob Bradley, you know, just, just, just because of the cult around the man uh, that, that this was going to be a proper rebuild. And despite the fact mm-hmm. that here comes Lorenzo you know, and, and that we lost our way a little bit in terms of the fans' expectation for the season. I, you know, coming out of it with the dust settling, I do see a lot of positives. The first was we played with house money. You know, there was no expectation to do anything last year, despite the fact that we all got on that hope train yeah. at a certain point. Um, you know, playing the kids to that extent is always a recipe for disaster. But at the very least, uh, we solved, you know, Toronto's been carrying this albatross around their head of what to do with our academy crop for a long, long, long mm. time. Uh, and integrating academy players into the first team has been kind of the bane of our existence because there is a certain uh, contingent of TFC fans that think that it should be much more of a breeding ground for Canadian talent. And that ignores the fact that you cannot be competitive. You know, it's and it's not a Canadian thing, it's an academy team. But But those same people, rightly so, talk about you know tfc by virtue of the way that mls uh structures its its areas where teams can pilfer uh players for their academy yeah. structure we have access to the greater toronto area and most of southern ontario and as you know probably from the world cup brampton ontario which is in our purview yeah. is pretty much a hotbed of of untested soccer talent so there's this disconnect between you know the press that says we're sitting on a gold mine here and then the reality of how how you know who makes it to the from the academy to the first team and how they perform and then notes on you know are we treating them well are we giving them enough minutes are we giving them meaningful minutes we kind of put that to bed last year by just mm. throwing all the academy yeah. kids at the wall and seeing seeing what stuck so in addition to kind of figuring out this crop of academy kids which i think was unbelievably important yeah some good some bad uh, and some good and bad in in terms of you know the, the obviously not everybody showed very well last mm. year and the ones that did became trade bait so we ended up saying goodbye to you know quite a few uh pieces of of the squad younger pieces of the squad you know uh Ralph Preso comes to mind Jacob Schaffelberg comes yeah. to mind certainly Luca Petrasso comes to mind mm. um simply because we they they were the only players that other teams were willing to look at in, in terms of interleague transfers and stuff like that. And um Toronto, you know, we knew that this team wasn't going to be as young on average uh coming into this year as last year. Some of that may have been uh, uh decided by what the goings on of last year, but certainly we knew that we were not going to feel the team as young. And so it's it's sad to say goodbye to some of those prospects, you know, the bird in the hand kind of mm. adage. But uh, we, you know, when you sign Lorenzo Insigne and Federico Bernadeschi, you lock yourself into a window to maximize those players uh, in your squad. Yeah. And you cannot be also thinking about prospects that may come good into their prime five, six years later when that is after the window to use your players. <laughs> so we had to make some tough decisions. But, you know, in the case of Luca Petrasso, we were all wondering what the hell was going on because, mm. you know, aside from Crescito, uh, we didn't have a lot of natural left backs on on the yeah, team. Exactly. And then here we go and we and we send one away. And then a week later, Crescito retires and then returns yeah. to, to Genoa. So, you know, sitting on our soapbox, it didn't seem like there was a lot of logic going on. And I'm pleased to say, you know, over the last week, week and a half with this massive influx of new signings, we're starting to see this team take shape uh yeah you know leading up to this season which is a very very good thing because where we were prior to all these moves was this kind of weird limbo where we we were really questioning the logic of the front office you know if moves were even coming and and what was going to happen you know coming into coming into this new season 
Yeah, that's just gonna say before, like bringing up some of the players that you've, you know, some of the big names which we'll go into that you sign. I mean, mm -hmm. Mavinga's gone to LA Galaxy, Daniel Henry as uh, Minnesota, mm -hmm. both goalkeepers left. Uh, you've mentioned there Petrasso, Schaffelberg, Rashito's gone, uh, Priso went in the exchange in the trade for mm -hmm. Mark Anthony K. So, what, what, what was the feeling like before these arrivals came? You're seeing all seeing this. Looking back at this roster, going well, we haven't got a goalkeeper. <laughs> we don't have exactly. a left back. We've got exactly. Like, how, and how is this? Yeah, that, you, you said it. That, that's exactly how it went. I mean, people, <laughs> people. It's it's rare for a club, uh, and and just to just to bring it micro, it's rare for TFC in an off season to have such a defined checklist of targeted holes in the roster. I mean, certainly goalkeeper was a was a huge one. <laughs> yeah. We said goodbye to our our number one and our number two goalkeeper, uh, but. Uh, you know, you, so you said it, there was this feeling of of almost panic um, because the expectations were so high. And, uh, you know, just Sean Johnson was an interesting one because the rumors were pervasive at the outset of the mm -hmm. of the offseason that TFC had essentially dropped a huge bag of money off at his driveway. And his <laughs> response was no thanks. So when the news came back that TFC and Sean Johnson were again trying to negotiate a deal, I mean, I certainly said this. I I wondered out loud, you know, what was our plan B? Were we just waiting mm. around for for Sean Johnson to figure out yeah. that you know New York wasn't going to pay him <laughs> what he wanted? Like, what was our other option? Because, it, you know, it, it it behooves nobody to only have a plan A and and no backup plan. Yeah. So so it it really did feel that way. And luckily, uh, it looks like we got our guys. So so credit to the front office you know for for sticking to their guns essentially and and getting what what they wanted and you know certainly Sean Johnson is a huge signing for the yeah. club uh you know if, if you look at uh, if you do a deep dive on his stats in comparison uh last year's stats in comparison to our our previous number 1 Alex Bono you know it, it, there are su significant areas where Sean Johnson is superior but there's also a lot of of major areas where they're quite similar so okay. In a in a stats base, it's maybe not it doesn't paint the most convincing picture. But I think the best thing I've read on the issue is we know what the floor is with Sean Johnson. Yeah. And that's super, super important. And the other thing is it's just a matter of maybe it was just time for everybody to move on. When you when your defense loses confidence in themselves, they start looking for people to blame and then they blame the keeper and it creates yeah. just bad vibes all around. And it does it it does no good for anybody. So mm. it just it seems like maybe it was just time to move on uh, full yeah. stop with respect with respect to that. Um, and, you know, just going from the spine up, right, we've we've rebuilt our defense, which, uh, you know, unfortunately means less minutes for some of the center backs that were really looking to be undroppable. Some of the kids that performed mm. very well last season, I'm speaking almost entirely about Lucas McNaughton, who, yeah. who came over from from Pacific uh, FC in the KMPL last year. Um, he's going to see a significant reduction of it, mm. in his minutes, um, but you can't fault tfc for going after a, a, a substantial defensive rebuild after leaking 66 goals yeah uh, tying the franchise worst two seasons running right yeah. and missing the playoffs uh, uh two seasons running so um that's that's exciting stuff and then moving into the midfield i mean our first choice uh three in the midfield played together for a grand total of 45 minutes last season owing mm. to injuries so they're essentially new signings. Mark Anthony Kay is essentially a new signing. You know, Jonathan Osorio was re-signed um, yeah. and there was a significant fear that we were going to lose him uh, over the off season because uh, his dream has always been to play in Europe. He's, he's getting to the age now where it's now or never. Yeah. Uh, the club doesn't, I, you know, I, in every case, between a player's wishes and a club's desires, I think the player needs to win out. Otherwise, your club is not going to recruit any mm -hmm. any new blood to replace that player. So TFC wasn't going to stand in his way. It it's it's a great thing that it worked out and that he's yeah. back. Um, you know the the big hole. Uh, Toronto's one of the peculiarities of Toronto is you know we we absolutely need someone to deputize behind Michael Bradley, but who are we going to get to deputize behind <laughs> Michael Bradley, who is, you know, going to play as many minutes as he feels like playing. He's going to mm -hmm. start as many games as he feels like starting. Are we, is that a good use of resources to sign somebody uh, to deputize for Michael Bradley? That's going to see very limited minutes, you know, and 
is there even somebody in that price range that's even close to the level that Michael Bradley's at? TFC fans love to deride uh, the captain, but he had a career season last year. You know, he may be getting slower. He's certainly mm. not as mobile. Uh, you know, we're starting to see a, a decline in 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 ground speed and recovery speed and that sort of thing. But his intelligence is still off the charts. And, you know, if you can surround Michael Bradley with with mobile eights, uh, you know, a, a better center back pairing that that will cover for some of his lapses, I think you'll you, at, at least for this year we're not he's not going to be a concern there but, mm. but in terms of depth it, it's terrible to have one functioning number six you know that's always a it's yeah. always a concern uh uh and then you know forwards uh signing adama diamande obviously is a depth signing um but we cannot undervalue the fact that he's a bob guy and mm. when you're dealing with a manager like bob bradley a manager slash sporting director like bob bradley uh, I think that's important. He's got a very defined, very idiosyncratic system of, per, of the way he prefers his teams to play. Obviously, there was a bit of a disconnect with the club last year in terms of that. So bringing in more guys, especially uh, in the forward position, where we had a lot of issues last year, especially when uh, we said goodbye to our number 10, Alejandro Pozuelo, yeah. uh, because Bob doesn't like playing with 10s. He, you know, he doesn't he doesn't like employing a 10. Um, and that did a lot to the confidence of of uh, especially um, uh, 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 Jesus Jimenez, who had mm. made a great partnership, who was developing a great partnership with with Alejandro Pozuelo, and not so good of a partnership when we suddenly switched to wing to an emphasis on wing play with Bernadeschi and and, and say, Lorenzo Insigne, uh, you know, and then of course the the our second striker Io Akinola, he's had a tough go. I mean, he he tore his ACL. Uh, it's been a rough recovery. Uh, he's seen his minutes decline. Mm -hmm. He's most definitely, you know, like a Eddie Nketiah kind of striker that you know <laughs> you need to give minutes to. Yeah. But if they're not earning the minutes, then you don't get minutes, and and it's the old chicken egg conundrum, right? Yeah. Um. But on paper, you know that those two are very different center forward strikers. You know, uh, 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 Io Canola is much more of a hold up man. Jimenez is much more of a technician slash poacher. So on paper. If we can, if these guys can figure it out, you know, we, we have got a much stronger forward core than it looked for most of last yeah. year. And, you know, having Adama there to sort of push them and maybe platoon with them and, and who knows, you know, maybe earn the job of our, of our number one, number nine uh, off the back of incredible goal, uh, uh, goal performance. That's a wonderful problem to have. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah definitely. You know? Um, yeah and and then oh just 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 finished yeah, you know cool. wing wingers obviously you know mls can't do a chelsea uh mm. mls teams can't do a chelsea there's an no. emphasis on parity in the league we have a salary cap uh the lack of depth behind our italian wingers is concerning mm. to say that it's a toronto fc problem exclusively is a misnomer to say that it's a big problem for Toronto FC because of the quality on the wings <laughs> and the precipitous drop off to anybody that would have to uh, spell for them in case of an industry of an injury or a significant loss of, of time is uh, a, a horrible situation, yeah. but that's one of the peculiarities of MLS. So we yeah. know that going in uh, it's not, it's not rosy, but it, it just is what it is, you know? Um, yeah. And then, and then it needs to be mentioned uh, going macro again, uh, that this is going to be a crazy season. The MLS is insistent on uh, this League's Cup break in the summertime where MLS and Liga MX teams are going to play a World Cup-style tournament yeah. <laughs> for the whole month of July and the league breaks. Um, it means that our season is very, very front-loaded. So we're playing mm -hmm. something like 28 games before we break for League's Cup and then finishing the season with something like 10 games. So the old... Uh, hack the old mls hack which the seattle sounders are famous for <laughs> is to sort of coast through the first half of the season gain momentum leading into the back half of the season yeah coast into the playoffs and yeah. and <laughs> and often time hit form just as you know the mls playoffs are rolling around and, and yeah. they hoist the cup that's not going to happen this year and in the same respect you know the way that we structured our season last year, like let's play the kids and then wait for our summer arrivals to come in is also not going to work this year. Mm -hmm. So the emphasis is on every team to hit the, the ground running. Therefore, 
a proper off season that Toronto FC has enjoyed for the first mm. time in a while, and with, <laughs> with you know most of their pieces in place, becomes immeasurably more important. So it it is, uh, uh, it's exciting times for the club, and I can't believe I've gone through all the players without mentioning Victor Vasquez. Exactly, <laughs> potentially. You know, I know it's sacrilege to say it when we've had Sebastian Giovinco at our club, but, uh, you know, Victor Vasquez might be my favorite player to ever wear the TFC shirt. He was the missing piece that brought us to the mountaintop. Um, you know, we don't necessarily, we can, we can guess at what his role is going to be coming mm -hmm. in. I can't imagine it's a starter. I imagine he's going to see limited minutes. You yeah. know, injuries plagued him his first spell with the team. But the exciting thing here is, you know, who's going to say no to Victor Vasquez moving into an administration role once his playing days are over and nobody. Uh, yeah, and I, yeah. th I, I mean, that was the goal when we had him the first time. So if that's not something that's been discussed and something that's been bandied around with, with the player as he nears the end of his playing career, I would be very surprised. And, and having a coach, having a, having a personality like that in the coaching staff, is is an unbelievable uh potential but you know as a player he ain't washed yet and considering you know that there'll be an emphasis on wing play uh obviously for yeah. tfc this year he might be an amazing wrinkle to throw in uh later in games especially when we're looking to change tactically because we can switch our play. You know, he's a magician out there. So we can suddenly have much more of a central presence to maybe break down a low block or that sort, or if our wingers aren't getting any joy, he offers a tactical flexibility in the midfield that we didn't have before and a depth in the, a veteran depth in the midfield that we certainly didn't have last year. So I think that's monumentally positive moving forward. Brilliant. You um you mentioned there um obviously the importance of uh, uh, Sean Johnson um to the uh to the back office and Matt Hedges has also been brought in in defence and you talk about how everything just needed to like it's, that's not working we need to make some big changes here and Toronto seems to have followed that idea of let's get some MLS experience in here and shore up the spine of our team signing Jonathan mm -hmm. Sorio back as well getting him committed long term you've now got that central the goalkeeper center of defense and center of midfield looks very set and with mm. plenty of experience going into this season yes absolutely uh yeah i mean matt hedges is an interesting one because obviously uh his closest approximation in terms of tfc history is drew moore who did great things for the club mm. and shored up our back line uh leading into you know the glory the glory days the the high watermark of the club so there's an expectation Matt Hedges will do the same thing. Of course, you know, to turn to the pessimistic side, there has to be a reason that FC Dallas didn't re-up mm -hmm. on Matt Hedges. So there, you know, certainly uh, there is a concern with the player's age, et cetera, et cetera, yeah. uh, his mobility. But, you know, Matt Hedges is not uh, the attack dog center back. He's the stay at home center back. And, mm -hmm. and certainly uh, that was the, the larger need. Uh, people people in TFC land want to conflate this move with Mavinga's departure. They're not the same player. If anything, no. Mavinga in his prime would have been the perfect pairing for Matt Hedges, uh, but they are entirely different center backs uh, and, and would have been perfect together. But unfortunately, that's not the case. <laughs> um, we, you know, it hasn't been made official yet, uh, but certainly Bronby in the Norwegian league has uh, tweeted a goodbye to the player but it certainly looks like Sigurd Rosted who's going to have the best nickname in the world <laughs> yeah. but, uh, it certainly looks like we've we've got that deal over the line and that is an ideal center back pairing we've got the attack dog and then we've got mm. the stay at home center back uh, I don't like what it means for Lucas McNaughton's minutes because yeah. I think he showed himself really well last year uh, in an area where most were not mm. uh, so and I think you know, for his for the sake of his development, it's unfair to the player to sort of put him back in in kind of the center back core. But it remains to be seen, like, you know, what is our, our you have to assume that the two the two new players are going to be our starting center back pairing and, yeah. and, and be sort of penciled in on the team sheet. Um, but, you know, we've got quality depth behind there. I just don't like this idea that Lucas McNaughton is now depth outright because i do i do think and my, my co-hosts agree with me they think yeah. that he's not ready for prime time and that we've seen his ceiling 
I, I tend to disagree. And I, I saw enough from the player that I am low, you know, uh, lowercase uh, D disappointed that this seems to spell sort of the end of significant minutes for Lucas McNaughton. But what, what do I know? We, he may, mm. he, we, we may rotate the, the squad a lot more, uh, you know, depending on, on our opponent and yeah. health and that sort of thing. So, so who knows, but, but yeah, Matt Hedges is an interesting one. Yeah, I guess with his age and the amount of games you're going to be playing at Northern, maybe then he's, well, the Open Cups is, the Canadian Championship might be his. Yeah, the, absolutely. League's Cup now, he, you're the starter for this. Then we'll see if yeah, you're that ready can't... next season. Um, yeah, you know, you make a really excellent point. You know, most of our talk on League's Cup is about the annoyance of the of the league pausing. Yeah. <laughs> but it's also a ton more games. And so we mm. probably will see that that squad rotation that you're talking about. So there will be more opportunities uh, for, for players that are sort of on the periphery of, of the ideal starting 11 to see more significant time, mm-hmm. which is good because, you know, I'm sure you're going to get there. Uh, we've got uh, two prospects that, uh, you know, in the case of, I guess, both of them have done quite a few over the last few seasons, training tours around the UK. I'm talking, of course, yeah. about Jaden Nelson and Jaquiel Marshall yeah. Reddy. Uh, they've attracted interest, uh, you know, clubs like Liverpool, clubs like Arsenal, et cetera, et cetera. Nothing over the line. Um, you know, the the suspicion is that maybe Toronto FC has priced them too high or, or any number of innumerable things. But, you know, certainly uh, it's a tale of two players. Jaquiel Marshall Reddy, uh, you know, in training, uh, many, many scouts uh, with pedigrees much higher than Toronto FC scouting department <laughs> sees him as a modern attacking right back or right wing back. You know, he's yeah. he, his, his preferred position. But of course, at that age, preferred position, eh, his, his so preferred much. position <laughs> is, is an attacking, you know, sort of an attacking mi- midfielder sort of situation. But, you know, with sponge brain and the and his pace and 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 his natural talent on the ball, he was identified as a as a modern fullback in the game. And you both we both know how important that position is yeah. becoming in the modern context. Mm. Um so this season, you know, obviously he he had a good start to last year and then got injured and that sort of derailed yeah. his season. This year, it'll be interesting to see where TFC slots him in. My suspicion is because he is an attractive selling piece and they want to make, develop the player full full further. And there is a dearth of backup options at right back after Richie Larea. And, and if he goes back to Nottingham forest, there yeah. is nobody there. Exactly. Uh, yeah. I, I think uh, you'll, you'll see Jaquiel Marshall ready uh, occupy that, that spot as the preferred uh, position in Bob Bradley's system as he mm-hmm. continues to develop. Jaden Nelson is more interesting. Uh, you know, Jaden yeah. Nelson's preferred position unfortunately is one occupied by a certain lorenzo and singing exactly, there's yeah. not so so you know there is a potential that we'll see Jaden slot in at that position to spell out lorenzo when we mm. see the squad the rotation and stuff like that of course that's not a player you want to take off your starting 11 if they're fed no, yeah. anytime <laughs> at, at any time but um, is there um but, before you go to the bit, mm, one bit I wanted yeah. to ask you about? Um, I'll give you like two sort of questions around the, the, yeah. the Signe Nelson bit. We saw Nelson come into that number ten role at times, yeah. kind of last yeah. year as well. But that we doesn't sure really did. suit what Michael Bradley was. What Michael Bradley yeah. does is lone six, maybe. Um, yeah, the one part I mean, is could I, that be used. I was I was really impressed with how he adapted to that midfield role. Mm. I I really really was. I mean, you know there were a few mares he's a young yeah. player you have to expect that but in terms of his positioning the way there was a measurable increase of his awareness and 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 smarts in occupying yeah. that position and how he was able to connect with the with a pretty flawed island of misfit toys midfield <laughs> uh, i thought was very impressive so mm. i'd almost like to see him spell into that midfield trio yeah. Uh, it, it, you know, and just to get in more minutes because the, mm. the opportunities in, in left winger are going to be very few and far between. Yeah, exactly. Um, and, and he needs to play. And so I do, I do think that might be the move for, for Jaden this year at TFC to, to sort of split time between sort of Lorenzo's understudy and kind of Mark Anthony K slash Jonathan Osorio's understudy as a, as a sort of eight ten hybrid, yeah. uh, you know, you know, getting up some minutes in that midfield, but that was a big surprise. The utility of the player was a mm. big, big surprise because, 
you know, he often was uh, deployed at winger uh, at the beginning of the season. And yeah. there were a lot of games where he looked like a newborn deer out there. And <laughs> yeah. So to see him uh, sort of come into his own in a position that was of need for the team mm. and also would be of need for his prospect staying with the team, I think is immeasurably positive. Yeah. And I, I'm looking forward to big things from Jaden Nelson this year. Yeah, I, I I interviewed him last year, partway through the nice. season, and so I'm just nice. after Insigne arrived, and he said like, "Oh, it's been great to play with him." Blah blah blah. Mm -hmm. Learn, like as a player, like you're learning off players like Insigne. Is, of course, it's going to be incredible. He said how he played as a number ten quite a lot in the academy as well. So he got mm. moved across from wings and centers. So he was quite, he seemed incredibly confident talking to him. It was great. Like, to hear, yeah. like, yeah, I can fit in there. I'm more than happy. If that's where they want me, I'll go for it. Yeah, and I'll, absolutely. I'll give my all, so. absolutely. I mean, uh, I, I, I'm not, I'm not a player, but it's, I, I, I don't think it's a secret. You know, if you're that much more talented at a younger age group, you're always striker, right? Cause you're just scoring <laughs> goals for fun. And then you find your position later. And I think Jaden Nelson is a, is a good example of that, right? Like he was just, immeasurably better on on youth teams so he was occupying a much more prominent attacking role but as the level gets more you know as as he comes up levels he's yeah. going to have to find a place where he can best operate in a in a much more talented field of uh, of competitors so i i think it bodes well for his future and i also think um you know turning finishing this process with jaquille and turning him into a capable attacking minded right back Mm. is the move for the player and and i, I yeah. I'm, I'm excited to see where that goes yeah definitely obviously it's like you say it's been maybe overvalued uh from the from the opinions of other teams but for, for yeah. toronto it means mm. that's more time they get with this young player um and i mean you look at the transfer market right now and this and the fees are obscene so yeah. you know 20 20 million may be may be a bargain but certainly i would i would say that in the years since that was bandied around the the value of the player has mm. decreased and that and that can't be that can't be ignored so yeah. there you know tfc uh needs to be careful about what you know hopefully it's a deal that they can't refuse but uh it, it remains to be seen obviously we know the player would love to end up in europe and the club i don't think wants to stand in his way so this is a good year for both uh jaden and jaquille to short to sort of show their worth uh uh spell out meaningful minutes for a competitive side uh and increase their trade value and increase their yeah. their, their market value uh wherever they may want to land next Definitely, like you say, it's quite a heavy loaded beginning of the season and with the European mm -hmm. European transfer windows in the summer, like they they've got plenty of time now to work quite well and to build yeah. up especially for Shaquille after having that long injury period. Now it's like right, okay, 100%. here's now his extended period to play. He's got players like uh, Kyle Larin there to um sorry, Richie Larea there to help yeah, yeah. with his improvements. Jaden Nelson now has Victor Vasquez and Insigne helping with his development, yeah. his possessions. So it's quite an interesting yeah. uh increase interesting developments for them and you you mentioned the big wing play and the other part of my question there was these comment the recent interview with Lorenzo Insigne saying she mm -hmm. like had all these options in Europe chose Toronto <sighs> and there was those that I, line at the end which probably didn't yeah start. I I I mean I I think it's lost in translation Possibly. you get what he's saying you know <laughs> yeah. it, it, it football is a religion in Europe and in Napoli it it you know it it's yeah. something else right <laughs> so I think it's a fair thing to say that you know he you know toronto's attitude towards winning isn't as for lack of a better word mental and and yeah. pervasive as as napoli's <laughs> i don't think that that's wrong i just think that you know and again it's lost in translation i don't know the context was was you know was the interviewer looking for that kind of clickbaity mm -hmm. sort of sort of comment and then sort of asked a, a leaded a leading question and got and got his soundbite his or her soundbite um, or was it, I, I mean, at the end of the day, you know, it didn't read very well, it certainly didn't read very well, <laughs> but, but I can understand the motivation behind it. So let, let, you know, let's consider it water under the bridge. Uh, mm. uh, you know, certainly the, the, the sources from training and the sources closer to the club say that there's absolutely no attitude problem. You know, Lorenzo's yeah. there to win. Uh, he's fiendishly competitive, 
but you know obviously you're not you can't compare toronto to napoli right yeah, and, yeah. and then <laughs> for, further to that you know tr- tfc has always been kind of like a bridesmaid to the bigger sports franchises in the city you know the blue jays in baseball the maple leafs in hockey the raptors yeah. in basketball uh so you know this is a city where lorenzo could conceivably walk around you know shopping for 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 pastries and not be identified on the street yeah. whereas in napoli that's not possible no, so yeah. it, it, it's a it's a fair comment i just i just wish um you know it, it, it's a fair comment but the way that it was delivered and sort of the the yeah. tone <laughs> of the translation left a lot to be desired but you yeah. know it, it, it's 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 too little of a thing to really get bent out of shape over, I think. Uh, 100%. You know? I think, like, uh, looking at it from the outside in, it's quite yeah. easy to make these, like, big explosionary sort of reaction to this, mostly just because of how well Bernadeschi did coming in. Yeah. Was, like, yeah. It's like, oh, we've got Lorenzo Insigne. Like, he's coming here. He's going to be the greatest player in MLS. And then Bernadeschi arrives as well a little bit yeah. later, um, the announcement, and just plays, like, one of the best wingers in MLS. <laughs> so you've yeah, got the, yeah. The, <laughs> yeah uh you know mls is weird man yeah. <laughs> and and i don't think players coming over understand i just don't think you can get it until you're you're in it yeah you know i think this idea of the travel times uh it just doesn't wash until you're on a transatlantic flight or you know <laughs> yeah. on a on a transcontinental flight with you know it, it, uh, uh, a non-chartered flight you know except you know and then yeah. the trips to the so so and then you know i don't want to say playing on turf such a huge deal but it is a it is a deal yeah uh the the temperature differences you know going to play in houston versus yeah. going to play up up north in the state it's massive and then the physicality of the league is also something that i think uh you know specific to lorenzo he he underestimated Mm. um you know he's getting triple marked in some cases and these guys are going for his for his ankles so i do think um in addition to the fact that that lorenzo's personality is a lot different than federico's i mean federico he's a social media uh god basically (laughs) like he's elite level social media guy and uh he just captured the fan base in a way i think that that the expectation was for lorenzo too Mm. uh but i do think that in some ways it's kind of a perfect pairing because my impressions of lorenzo is that he never wanted to be that guy the mouthpiece for the team he would have preferred to do his speaking on the pitch and now having federico as the as the sort of clown prince of tfc socials yeah. uh frees him from having to 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 having that responsibility mm-hmm. and allows him to focus on the pitch we, we'll we'll see how it manifests in the season to come but i do feel like it may be a blessing in disguise and and how can you not love federico bernardeschi i mean exactly. man, he's just <laughs> just the the most charming human being on on the planet and he's he's certainly charmed the city uh it's a good problem to have you know which one of our two italian superstars is going to be the twitter <laughs> sensation is 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 not is not something that i would kick out of bed for eating crisps to use yeah. a, you know to use an <laughs> allegory right yeah so um Looking at the, like the transfers you come in, we sort of obviously mentioned how so many left, and there was this like, oh, what are we actually doing? What's going to happen? Yeah, so much pressure. Now we're we starting to see a bit of a philosophy as to what Toronto want to do long term. Now we've had the beginning of the season throwing in all the youngsters. Now we've brought in some superstars. And now we're getting some sort of MLS experienced players in the spine. And yeah, does it is it more clear now as you look at what the back office? It are does. Doing? It does. It it feels a lot clearer. Um, it it feels a lot more defined uh, in terms of like you just look at the depth chart and it it it, it does it's starting to make logical sense. Yeah. Uh, areas of need have been addressed uh, to a point. You know, people will complain that uh, we have an unused third DP spot coming into the season. I see them and I raise them this the inescapable fact of how many dps have been in and out the door at this club (laughs) over the last two years i think it's fair for the club to be gun shy uh and i also think it's fair to keep that as a resource if core if a course correction needs to be made uh coming up to the summer transfer window you know so if we don't see any uh breakthroughs in terms of our forward core 
you know, mm-hmm. and it's just a mess up there. And and we need a pylon essentially to convert chances coming in from the wings, and we're just not getting it. Um, having that that DP spot open isn't a measurable benefit. And and you know, one of the reasons that Bob had such a tall task when he arrived last season was the fact that we had been we had been saddled with so many con- bad contracts, yeah. bad deals, bad uh uh finances structures you know dating as far back as 2018 when we just opened the pocketbook to sign uh players following our our championship mm-hmm. season so there was a lot of faff to cut out in terms of in terms of personality and in terms of financially so to go back in to another deal when we're not 100 sure of what the needs are mm-hmm. uh i think is is idiotic i i would not turn away from you know signing Olivier Giroud to a one and done deal for yeah. massive money and use use that DP spot but TFC spent a lot of money uh and have seen pretty frustrating returns on that cash <laughs> so it's fair to assume that maybe the purse the the purse the the, the purse books have, uh, are closed a little bit and we're not privy to where TFC falls under the cap mm-hmm. uh you know the assumption is always that we are sitting on a war chest but the the messaging coming out of the club is that there's not as much money as as fandom thinks there is to make bigger moves, uh, and so it, you know we're holding on to this third DP spot. It mm. it it's most definitely the first thing that a cynical fan will target when they rage about uh, lack of performance. If lack yeah. of performance occurs, is the fact that we are are holding a DP spot, and that's fair. I mean, in this league, it is a it is a very important mechanism. And certainly, you know, going one light into the season when you're chasing results yeah. is illogical, but there's more to it than that. Nothing yeah. is ever binary. Mm-hmm. I do I do think it's it's probably the best move. Yeah. Yeah, especially with players like you say, like Nelson and Gilrod, it like they, they could be leaving in the summer. Um Richie Larea's yep. deal is only running till the summer. Exactly. As well. so exactly. At that point of time, there could be enough, quite a few changes happening then, and having that flexibility will definitely be absolutely used to absolutely. the uh, used to the squad. And looking at what they've done then, and going forward in as the season's not all that far away now. Um, not at what all. Are, what are their thoughts on? Is this uh, is this a, is this a uh, playoff team? Is this a challenger for MLS Cup now? Are they getting things mm. sorted? Uh, where where are you sitting I, on the on the team right now? On on paper, they're absolutely a playoff team mm. on paper, um, but the proof is in the pudding, and I don't I don't want to guess because so much was so weird last year. But I will <laughs> say this: um, we're very you know. One of the benefits of a cult of personality manager, sporting director like Bob Bradley is a defined system and defined Mm -hmm. targets. But the flip side of that is if it doesn't work out, you're then left with a roster that's almost entirely suited to the gaffer slash sporting director that's no longer there. And so I think this year it's important to, because we just got out from under so many bad deals. We don't want to find ourselves saddled with more. So right or wrong, I do think that this year there is a, a need to see some kind of upward trajectory on the pitch in terms of the team to maintain this experiment because mm. someone in the TFC brain trust is going to pull the plug if there isn't yeah. immeasurable growth simply because you don't want to be stuck with it with a Bob Bradley team without Bob Bradley. So mm. yeah, I, I do think that, that, that he's got a hotter seat this year. Uh, I do think that, that, you know, a consequence of a lot of these incoming players being Bob guys uh, takes a, puts the onus a lot more on the coaching staff. There, there, there's a lot. There's going to be a lot less excuses that are going to be acceptable uh, with respect to underperforming. It's difficult to you know twenty. The front loaded schedule makes it really impossible for me to to make a prediction. On paper, I do mm-hmm. think this team goes to the playoffs. But in the reality, I have no idea. I have no idea. I know that, you know, the expectation every year is for Toronto FC to win the Voyagers Cup, which is our version of the FA Cup uh, or the Carabao Cup or the U.S. Open Cup. Uh, It's a much uh, more competitive field every year as the Canadian Premier League grows into its own identity. Uh, But that would be my 
my expectation to be competitive for the Canadian championship, to be competitive in MLS, to see uh, marked improvement in terms mm. of structure, in terms of, of, of results over the last year. But I, I, I can't tag a playoff berth yet. Yeah. I just can't. There's too much, too much up in the air, too much that could go wrong uh, in the first half of the season. And, you know, beat performing in the first half is immeasurably more important this year than it's ever been in, mm. in, in MLS and, you know, TFC traditionally haven't started season strong. So yeah. <laughs> I, I, I just, and especially over the last little while. So I, I, I'm not, I'm unwilling to, to sort of make that, make that shout, but yeah. I'd like to see it. <laughs> yeah. I'd like to see it. And I think if we don't, it'll be a fire sale uh, with a lot of knee jerk reactions from the powers that be. So I would love to see it. Uh, but I, I'm not willing to call it just yet. No, it's difficult looking at, like, especially yeah. when you're going through an off season and every other team in the uh, MLS is going, oh, we've improved. Like our roster's yeah. improving. Yeah. Uh, you can't, yeah. you can only fit yeah. so many players in the, uh, so many teams in the playoffs. Um, exactly. But exactly. yeah, there's, you can. I personally, I feel like Toronto are really going to have to go out and try and compete for one of the cups as well. It's going to be quite key to get some yeah. silverware back. You brought in these big players who want to want to sell absolutely with a trophy in front absolutely of fans. 100%, 100%. Uh, but yeah the, yep. so it'll be uh interesting to see how well we can compete in the like the canadian championship to say open cup as well and things like that so yeah yeah be, uh, yeah be very interesting to see what happens but yeah we look forward to the look forward to the season ahead jeffrey thank you so much for joining me uh today it's great thank you it was a lot pleasure of anytime my friend <laughs> uh and i look forward i look forward to seeing the show and we will we'll chat again soon